Lord. We have nothing to rest on save the workings of your grace alone. Blessed be your name. Tonight, we sound our shouts of victory. Not in the things that we are able to do, but in the things that you are able to do through us. We shout our shouts of victory unto the one who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we can ever ask or say. According to the power that is at work in us, we shout our shouts of victory because the Lord himself has gone up ahead of us with a shout. We shout our shouts of victory because the shout of the king is in our midst. We shout our shouts of victory because those who will come in there, clap your hands on you people and shout at the God with a voice of joy. chapter what four really i'm going to do a major digression from first john to hebrews so that i can explain certain things and establish certain things so that as we move into the perfection of love some things will be clearer are you following me there's there's some scriptures we cannot avoid i i wish everyone was here when we're teaching first corinthians 13 was everyone here when that which is part passes then that which is full will come do you is there people who are here okay now, I'm hearing only five years ass. I really wonder what you do with the rema you collect. It looks like some of you used to use it. The, your jota to go and buy kose. <laughs> Amen. When I was in ABU, one evening I went out to not get to buy kose. Then I saw our exam scripts. <laughs> the one we wrote like two years before, and I told myself, if these people knew how tense we were when we were writing this exam, they will not do this to this paper. They said, I've kept this paper in a cupboard, hallowed, somewhere, exalted. Do you understand? <laughs> Sacred. Because of the kind of sweat that dropped on it. Even Tule cannot understand this one. When you write one exam in the university, you will know what I'm talking about. Just one. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 
All right, is this where we stop? Give me verse 17. I think there's verse 17. Let's let's do a recap of verse 17. Hearing, no, in fact, give me verse 16. But how do we reach here? Who passed verse 17? Who is the person who put that verse 18? She kneeled down, raised up her hands, close her eyes, and say, Lord Jesus. And verse 16. And we have known and believed what? The love that God had for us. Now, listen to me. This this statement, we have known and believed, is where everything centers on. Are you with me? We have known and believed the love that God has for us. Hear me. All of the answers that you are looking for is in the love of God. Every answer. If there's a question yet unanswered in your life, it's just an aspect of the love of God that is yet to be revealed to you. Now, here, I didn't say that it's yet to be given to you. I said that it's yet to be revealed to you. That's the reason why one of the things you must desire every time is to come into liberty. And liberty, by the definition of scripture, is the taking away of the veil. Are you following me? Liberty is not freedom to do. Liberty is freedom to see. For whatever a man sees, by the law of the spirit, he becomes him. Are you following me? Yes. Uh -huh. it, it would be bad to talk 2 Corinthians 3 a little today. Alright? Give 2 Corinthians 3 and let's do a quick read from verse 1. Alright? But notice, whatever a man can see in tempting. Jesus gave a parable as we try to get 2 Corinthians 3. And he gave examples of two people who had been forgiven. Then he said, who do you think will love much? Then the answer was simple. The one who was forgiven much. Does it then mean, because I used to have a problem when I was growing up. They gave me an impression that if I didn't do very bad things, there was no way God could use me very much. Did anybody ever feel like that? Yes, like Saul of Tarsus was an armed robber. He killed believers. And that's why when he came, God used him. But nobody told us that Peter was a fisherman. And all he needed to do was fish. And God still used him. Because sometimes when you hear those kind of scriptures, as the, the one who's forgiven much is the one who loves much. Then you are now thinking, oh, it's because my own foundation was a little clean. I didn't know any girl. I didn't, you know, I didn't, what else? I didn't steal anybody's anything. I didn't. Then you are thinking, oh, that's the real reason why I'm not able to love God. No, no, no. Slow down. Listen to me. There is no love God showed you in redeeming you from your act of sin that can be compared from the redemption from the nature of sin. Uh, are you following me? No action of sin, sir, that you were redeemed from that compares to the redemption from the nature of sin, from an eternal hold of Satan that began from Adam. It then means that if you think that you were forgiven little, it's because you don't even have an idea what sin looks like. Are you following? If not, the tendency is to believe, oh, well, the, the, the real reason why I've not been able to love God so much is because, well, I didn't do so much. Now, let's not, let's not discount the fact that, especially when it comes to what you can account for in the natural, it is easier for those who have done a lot of bad to account for what God had done in their lives. Do you understand what I'm saying? A lot easier. Because for those of you who didn't do a lot of bad things, the tendency is that you don't even get to see how much you've been loved until God begins to reveal to you the true state of your heart. That your righteousness is as filthy rags. Listen to me. It means that if you even had a righteousness before you came to Jesus, and you still consider it righteousness, you are not, you are not seeing yet. Uh -uh. Because the moment you begin to see, what will you be seeing? Feel the rags. So really, the real problem is, 
we have known and believed the love that God has. The moment you know it and you believe it, everything is up. Are you following me? Yeah. That's why we sing songs like, Your love has drawn me, dear Lord, I come down to your feet. Here now I come. And what do we say next? Take me and mold me, dear Lord, I come. What's the last thing we say? Teach me. Because listen to, you can't understand the love of God until you are taught it. One of the things I say when we join marriages in covenant is you ask her or you tell her, teach me your love. No, no, you don't understand. You tell him, teach me your love and I'm committed to learning it. Because you see, the greater tendency is to love people according to your measure of love. That's the reason why when the average Christian gives two million as offering, he thinks that God should stand up on his throne and clap for him. Because money means so much to him and it means nothing to God. That really what God was receiving when you were given two million was a heart. Now I know some of you, you say so, let me just give God the heart and give the two million. <laughs> you are a thief. Every heart has to be expressed. Do you know what I'm saying? Yes, yeah. So somebody's two million is somebody's two thousand. And God collects the two thousand and blesses the man just the way he collects the two million and blesses the man. They are not better. The two million guys is not better than the two thousand guys. The, see, the moment you understand the operation of the heart, you will know that you have never had a limitation. Oh God. You know, it's easy to sit down, sir, when a project is running, and then you say to yourself, Hey! If I had the money. But you have 20k. I mean, my brother, if that 20k didn't come out, 2 billion cannot come out. So really, the training is a heart. I had certain contemplations with God and discussed with the pastors and a few of the leaders. I won't speak about it publicly. I'm serious. Because I, I'm noticing a trend. It is cutting across everyone that I notice that the hand of God is upon I think I've mentioned it to my wife once or twice. And then I'm thinking, what is he up to? But this is this indeed is Adulam. The cave of the making. And then, sir, in Romans chapter 8, the Bible speaks about a particular day of the unveiling or the manifestation of the sons of God. Have we really sat down to think about it? What did life look like for David? For the 13 years he was jumping from king to king. Have you ever sat down to think of it? Have you put yourself inside that picture? Have you ever imagined that the real reason why the scares and the javelins are coming against you is because the oil is all in your body? Many times because we don't bring ourselves to talk. We don't really arrive at meditation. Because we really don't arrive there. It becomes easy for Satan to puncture us. And you know I said to you on Sunday, the Bible says, do not be weary of well-doing, for you will reap if you faint not. The Bible says, you have need of patience, Jeffers, that after you have done the will of God, you might receive the reward. No, no, no. It didn't say patience, will of God, then reward. No, 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 no. The patience comes after you have done the will of God. So, your season of patience begins the moment you align with the will of God. 
That means it is not will of God, then reward. That means it is always will of God, then patience, then reward. Now, if you join this scripture with the last scripture I quoted, if you faint not, what you want to ask is, if your period of patience was between where I'm standing and where Pastor Omale is sitting, the problem is, listen to me, the Bible says, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, and in due time, oh, Jesus said to the disciples, of the times and the seasons reserved when? In the Father. No man knows. It then is judged. You can be here and not know that the next step is your breakthrough. Hold on. I wish somebody heard. I wish. And the Bible says you will reap if you faint not. Now, note, I, I want to register something with you that must stay with you. It then means, judge, if I travel till I arrive at this point, and I get weary here, Pastor Jesse. They say reward on the next step. But that reward will not be. There's no way you can get God to release it without taking the step. Now imagine that I get weary here. And I go back. Uh-uh. See, that means part of the greatest gifts that God gave a believer is hope. The Bible says hope does not disappoint. Because the love of God, listen to me, that means the anchor of hope, sir, is the love of God. I know the one I believed in, and I am persuaded that he is able. Do you know, that's where hope hangs. If you don't know the love of God, you can come here, then the reason why you will turn back is, did God really mean it when he said it? Oh God. Is not shed abroad in your heart by the Holy Ghost. That's Romans 5 verse 5. I'm quoting now. If the love of God is not shed abroad in your heart by the Holy Ghost, listen, he didn't say love for God, he said the love of God. Yeah. It then means, sir, as I approach, one of the convictions that must be found in my heart is even though my waiting has been long, God loves me. That's why, sir, we preach and we say that when we journey, we say to ourselves, He is our reward. If there was never a day of the breakthrough, the honor and privilege of walking with Him is good enough to walk forever. Hallelujah. If you don't know these kind of citations, there's no way hope will keep you to the end. Because really, if you arrive here 
and this is overwhelming you then you didn't have a proper walk Enoch come on sorry my sister she knew that you Enoch walked with God what is walked with God he wasn't the only one that the Bible recorded in Genesis walked with God the Bible also said concerning Noah that Noah walked with God but see the reward of Enoch. The Bible says Enoch walked with God. Now walking with God meant as they were walking, they were talking with God. He was understanding the things in the heart of God. And God was saying to him, you see, that's what I'm doing in the earth. See those sons of Cain. See them. That's where the darkness is. See what they're trying to do in the earth. They were still walking and talking and walking and talking. And Enoch had taken too much of the divine nature. There was nothing in this world that was worthy of him. So God looked in the world and thought, what reward do we give Enoch? Noah's reward was that he condemned one world and started a new one. That was Noah's reward. But what was Enoch's reward? That's what Hebrews chapter 11 mentioned when he said, Men of whom the world was not worthy. That you get to a place where God is the only thing that makes sense. I laugh at people when they condemn certain songs. Like you take the whole world and give me Jesus. You take the whole world. And give me Jesus. You take the whole world and give me Jesus. I'm satisfied. I'm satisfied. Cause I have decided I'll follow Jesus. I have decided to follow. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. On every theological standpoint, that song is correct. The Bible calls Satan the God of this world. It then means that when you say take the whole world, you're not talking about the earth. The earth is the Lord. The fullness thereof. But you cannot be pursuing even the earth. You've got to be pursuing the one who owns the earth. Then if he bequeaths to you the earth, he will also bequeath to you the understanding by which the earth is covered. People receive inheritances and do not receive government. The story of the prodigal son is supposed to be sufficient for you to know that you are not ready for an inheritance until you are ready for government. An inheritance without government is a curse. It's the reason why voting a Christian into electoral office might not necessarily be Nigeria's problem. It might not necessarily be Nigeria's solution. No, voting a Christian who understands governance so that he does not take an office for which he was not prepared. That was the blessing of God on David. Did you think shepherding in the bush was sufficient for is Israel sheep? Shepherding in the bush was sufficient to kill Goliath. But it was not sufficient to bring God's government to Israel. Understand the blessedness of your waiting. Because in the spirit, I said to you, is what a man beholds that he becomes. Either he said, we know and we have believed. That's what I'm trying to explain to you. Because if you have not seen it, if the love of God is not touching, it does not be revealed to you. The ability to wait until you enter into your inheritance, you will lose it. 
by the marks that you have met the love of God is that you hope all things. If you find a man whose hope is breaking, is his love. No, you see what I'm saying? I say it's his love. You see where I showed you love? Yes, revelation. If you know and believe the love of God, you become such a stable Christian. There's no way you can believe the love of God and Jesus does not become your reward. He becomes your inheritance. That's all you are looking for. You get to a place that whether come back, that whether or not the reward is there, he is enough. <laughs> When you get to that place, one people that inspired me musically when I was growing up wrote a song and he said, Tunda inada yesu, ati kinzuchi yata, go anida koma iwa nankata iya isa. Tunda inada yesu, ati kinzuchi yata, go anida koma iwa nankata iya isa. Yaisa, 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 Yaisa. Oh, Yaisa. Tenda ina da Yesu, a chicken to chiata. Koma ni da koma iwa nankate Yaisa. Tenda ina da Yesu. A chicken zuchiata. Go on, it a coma in one and cut a yaisa. Tenda in a daesu. A chicken zuchiata. Go on, it a coma in one and cut a yaisa. 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 It's not, it's not the voice of a hopeless man. No, it's the, that's the real voice of a man full of hope. Because what keeps hope burning is content. Part of the reasons why you begin to lose hope is that you are losing contentment. And I told you, contentment is not the absence of a drive for more. That drive for more is a godly giving drive. It's a seal that says, no, I know I am better than this. But now this is what I have. And what I have is enough. Young man, there's a great inheritance ahead of us. And I don't want to lose any of you. Believe me. When I say I don't want to lose any I'm saying, I don't want anyone to arrive here and think I have been through so much. Then abandon, then turn and walk back right at the edge of a break. And so I owe you to teach you the things that make your heart strong as you pass on. Because we two are not there yet. There's a day I see. You don't want to know. Me too, I wake up in the morning's doses and I'm asking, are these things true? Are they possible? Is God about to really release a witness in the earth? A witness that will speak so loudly no wisdom on the earth can gain say? How is he about to do it? Because I don't see a sign or a wonder that the church is about to do that is sufficient to call attention to it. Oh, forgive me. I might sound to you like an unbeliever. But if miracles were sufficient 
to call the attention of the world. I think the church has got more than enough. We got miracle programs running daily on TV. And don't get it wrong. I believe in miracles. It spoke in its day. I was quoting today as we worship. I said to you, the disciples said, Lord, behold their threatening. What they mean is, that church that they said to us, it was valid, it was real. We felt it, our hearts quaked. When they called us into an inner room and they said, never again should you speak to anyone in that name. And that's always what Satan is afraid of. A generation that is born. That's what he's always afraid of. A generation that can witness. So what does he do? He comes by circumstances. And then he intimidates you. Till he can silence you. And many of us don't pray the prayer the disciples prayed. They said, Father, behold their threatening. Some of you are waiting until government arrests you. Then you will pray it. Some of you, poverty is a threat. Oh, someone does not know what Does anyone know what I'm talking about? Every time you have thought about what you wanted to do for God, poverty raises its head. And then it tells you, you don't have one over 150 of what it takes to do that. Some of you, disease is a threat. <laughs> Every time there's a major move of God about to happen, then your health begins to fail. And you don't know what it takes to get up and say, Father, behold, you are threatening. And the threat is always a real threat. Then he said, and grant your servants both that with boldness we might declare freely the gospel of Jesus. Then he told God how to He said, by stretching forth your hands to heal the sick and perform wonders in the name of your son Jesus. Now notice, in that context, Peter wasn't saying, when you stretch forth your hands, you will witness to them. He was saying, when you stretch forth your hands to heal, you will witness to us. We really do think that signs and one ah, sir, is it not Jesus resurrected from the dead? The soldiers came to report it. Herod and the chief priest said, come on, come, let's say to you guys. Do you know what that kind of settlement is? You think it's like on the table? No, let me explain it to you in contemporary terms. They had to give those guys what was bigger than their retirement benefit? Because those guys had to admit publicly that they went to sleep when they were supposed to be a guard. And then when they woke up, they know that they did not sleep. And the moment you do that kind of public witness, they are sucking you from your job. Then they promise to you, you will retain your job. But let's say to you, how much do you think those guys were saying? If a sign was sufficient to convict any man, was it in Herod who will say, we killed him? Now he has risen. Let us come out publicly and say to the world, we were the ones that killed him. We are sorry. But even the sign of the resurrection, the earth gained saved. So what sign do you think that the world is about to see? That will be strong enough a witness. No, you don't ask the right questions. What God was restoring, sir, was their boldness. So he said, grant that your servant will declare boldly by stretching forth your hands to heal. Meaning, every time you heal a sick, every time you lift a disease, you remind us that you are with us. Then our boldness to preach is now in place. If God is about to please a witness that will be seen from the east to the west, have you ever asked to ask what kind of witness will it be? 
the sign of the Son of Man. One day they came to Jesus and they said to him, show us a sign so that we can use it to believe that it is God who sent you. Then Jesus laughed. I'll bring you a contract, a seemingly contradictory scripture. After this, he said, an evil and adulterous generation seeks a sign. He said, but no sign will be given it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. He said, for as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the fish, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the belly of the earth. What Jesus was saying is, if you don't believe the resurrection, And when the resurrection came, sir, even the people who knew it was real were arguing against it. So what sign is the Lord about to do in the earth? One day he looked at the Pharisees. That's a seemingly contradictory scripture. And he said to them, you search the scriptures because you believe that in them you have eternal life. He said, but these scriptures are they that testify of me. He said, but you guys, you will not take it. He said, okay. He said, I bear witness of myself. And my witness is true. He said, but at least, if you will not take my witness, there's somebody else who is bearing witness of me. He said, the father is bearing witness of me. Okay, if you don't believe that witness, at least let the works that I have done. Until he died, they didn't believe. After he died, even when they saw the signs he was talking about, men were so hardened, they didn't listen. So let me ask you, what sign is left for the earth? If somebody has the answer, send it to me as a text. Because that's my job going, me and the Holy Ghost. What is the sign? Because I told God, I said, if I found grace in your sight. You know, Moses said, show me your face. And people are laughing and thinking, he was thinking, say, say to God, show me your face. That scripture had already said, Moses spake with God face to face. Like a man would speak to his friend. So if he was saying, show me your face, what was he looking for? <laughs> and somebody wrote on Facebook that our song is full of unbelief. I want to see your face. That Jesus has come and is the face of all that God is doing. And I laugh at people's ignorance. I just laugh. I pity people. If you don't understand, seek understanding. It means that, sir, if a man does not ask God, Jesus laid the principle in what you said. He said, ask and you will receive so that your joy will be full. He said, till now you have not asked me anything. Ask. Then he said, ask and it will be given to you. Seek, you will find. Knock and the door will be open. Whoever asks, receives. Whoever seeks, finds. Whoever knocks, the door is open to him. Hear me. Because the argument is the finished work. The work is finished. But one has to lead you there. That's why the Holy Ghost was given. The works is finished. But the fruit of the finished works are yet to be manifest in your life. So you ask the one to whom custody was given. Then he takes you there. What makes it unbelief? Didn't you hear that the labor of the fool will is here? You will get every one of them. Why? Because they do not know the way to the city. Is it because the city does not exist? The Bible says, God swore they will not enter into my rest, even though the works were finished. It means that it is finished, does not mean you have entered. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. If we have entered, what are we doing here? The moment we enter the fullness of the finished 
for he takes us don't show your ignorance please you don't understand us you know part of our problems is we are even unruly we have no respect for government so anybody can speak and we answer no don't stand saying if they say Baba Iye Adeboe has said something, at least before I answer, I should sit down somewhere and think. If Baba doesn't have anything, he has worked with God. Let's check this thing again now and be sure. Because I told you, God has never been angry with you because you came to God today. He receives it as much. He was the one who said to you to test them with spirit. Then you see that and say, but I better there's the way I don't understand this thing. Then even if you are fully convinced, because you are dealing with dignities, Jude lays it out carefully. We answer recklessly. Because we are very unruly people. Very unruly. I've never seen an unruly generation like my own. Anybody can get up and talk about an elder carelessly. If it was in the generation of your fathers, they'll cut your tongue. And let me take you out of the camp and castrate you. Because your type should not multiply. <laughs> Are you following me? Your, the anything that looks like you. That's how God used to talk in the Old Testament. Cut off his memorial from the earth. Come to the earth. Can, let there be nothing that gives an indication that that kind of man existed. Who God says that about you, my brother? Your fall is a bad one. I, is everybody following me? Exodus. We cannot faint because the law is you will reap if you fail not. It means that God owes a man who faints nothing. Okay. No, no, you didn't hear me. That means whatever you do, you have to stay in strength. And staying in strength is actually finding out what did God make for my strength. That's where I started from his professor chapter 4 verse 16. He said, for we know and we have believed the love that God has for us. Give me some questions from 3. That's why I said you should go. I don't understand how you went to the God never said me. 